understood that I wanted a leadership education, but I didn't know how to get it. And when I, when I came to Lemmy training, I could see that this was, that this was a way for me to, to really, you know, meet my own goals for being self-educated and, and for having a, a leadership education successfully implemented in my own home. So I've had many years to learn from, from great mentors and to also be a trainer for the last 10 years, uh, training, training lots and lots of wonderful, wonderful people whose lives have been changed. So we at Let Me have trained hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand mentors, and they each impact students and who knows how many thousands that is. We've built dozens of communities across the United States and they are thriving places of, of, uh, of real transformation. And I am super excited today to be able to co-present with you with uh, Tiffany Earl, who is one of the one of the co-founders of Lemmy. I've worked with and for her for a long, long time. But this is the first time we've been able to present together, and I'm excited about that. She and, and Anelody Milne were the ones who created Scholar Projects. This idea that you can actually uh, help a student through scholar phase. They are the co-authors of many books. I mean, they've each authored books and they're, they're the co-author of many books, including the New Commonwealth Schools book. Uh, she and her husband, Rick, have five children and she uh, has had the opportunity to watch them all grow up through this model and um, they're successfully implementing uh, the principles in their own lives. So. I'm going to turn it over to you, Tiffany. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kathy. I'm really excited to present with, with Kathy Malore today. As she said, we've been working together for almost two decades. Um, Kathy is not only a Lemmy trainer and master mentor, she's also the founder of Unleashing Your Voice and of Unleashing Your Pen, instrumental mentoring companies that work hand-in-hand -hand with the Lemmy Scholar Projects so that your youth can be great orators and writers. I'd like those who are listening or watching to make an agreement with yourselves. Raise your hand in your mind if you can agree to stop multitasking, maybe for just three hours. <laughs> um, I know that I'm asking the impossible, <laughs> but... There will be moments where you will have the thought to just stop and listen and feel and connect with the stories that Kathy and I are going to share and with the principles that we're going to share. In return, you will receive something. If you do this, if you come with a purpose, if you listen and watch with a purpose, you will find answers to your most pressing mentoring needs. You will learn principles and find guidance that will bless you and those that you mentor. You will learn more than what Kathy and I alone can teach. So if you can make that agreement with yourself, you will find the next three hours very rewarding. All right, fantastic. Let's get started by watching this short clip. It's only 46 seconds long. This one for me. Uh-oh. I got to clean that. I love that. I love that. I love that. So this makes me ask the question, what is needed? So, um, 
in this video where this little boy is pouring his juice and then walking to the table and slips and falls and then just, uh oh, and cleans it up again, goes back, pours it, walks, has two cups of juice, slips and falls. Uh oh, I need to clean it. <laughs> um, sometimes life feels like that. Sometimes it feels a little messy. Sometimes we fall in our juice. Um, sometimes we make spills. And um, when I first saw this, I was really amazed that he could go through his mess ups and spills so gracefully, just as a little, I don't know, maybe 18 month old, probably two year old. Tell me when you get that. Um, okay, there we here go. we go. We're good. So we're gonna talk about different mentoring tools and tool number one is the leadership grid and the scholarship ladders. And I wanna talk about where this little boy is on the leadership grid even though he's only two. I am not, there we go. So from the well-known story of Alice in Wonderland, we remember the conversation. Would you please, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. Vision is about knowing where we are going. Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind, to start out by thinking about your destination. So in this little video, the question is, what was the little boy's vision? What was he, what was he gonna do with his juice and his cups? you know, the, that he was trying to carry, where was he headed? Well, he, de he definitely wanted to go on a picnic. Yes. <laughs> All right, mission. The second ladder on the leadership grid is mission. What was this little boy's mission? What's he trying to accomplish? And what's his desire? Um, Kathy, what do you think his mission was? Well, I think success, you know, he had a, he had a vision. He wanted to be able to uh, accomplish it. He wanted to be able to, to make his own way in the world, right? At that age, they've got that, you know, I can do it myself attitude. And he had a, he had a spunkiness about him. Yeah. I think, I think part of his mission was definitely to get that juice over to the picnic. <laughs> You know, I'm going to, it didn't matter that he kept spilling it and kept falling. He was, he was going to, you know, get that over there. Okay. Our next ladder is abilities. For now, we're going to define abilities as character traits and attitudes. So this little boy definitely had ability. The thing that like I said before, that surprised me most was that when he fell, um, there was no shame. He just said, uh-oh, I failed. I better clean that. <laughs> he just goes over and gets a rag and starts to clean it up. So uh, I just felt like he, part of his ability was an I can attitude. He said, I can do this, you know, very, very different than, than sometimes when we have our falls. Right, Kathy? Yeah, he, he wasn't going to let anything stop him. I mean, you know, it was just, it was just a minor setback. No, no need to worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ladder number four. This is skills. What were some of his skills? Whereas abilities refer to who you are, skills consist of what you can do. So both be and do are important. So, Kathy, what were some things that this little two-year-old could do? Well, he did know how to pour, you know, he, he wasn't as accurate as one would hope, but he, he understood the concept, right? There's some physics involved there. He also, you know, knew where to go to get a rag and, and clean it up. He, he, he kind of had it all figured out and knew what he wanted. Yep. He, he knew how to pour. He knew how to walk. He knew how to clean. He had some skills. Okay, knowledge. The fifth ladder is knowledge. What knowledge did the little boy need in order to have a picnic like he was trying to do? Uh, again, Kathy, what knowledge did he have? Well, let's see. He, he knew, you know, 
what cups were. He knew how, you know, how to set them up so that they could hold liquid. He, uh, he knew, you know, what to do when something spilled, like you get a rag and you wipe it. You know, even yeah. if he didn't do it perfectly, he understood what, you know, what was, what was required. Yep. Okay, so we're gonna watch this just one more time and hopefully it works this time and everyone can see it. This is not for me. Uh-oh, I got a clean deck. I love that how it takes out with I won't build it. Uh-oh, I built. Oh. It's slippery. Okay. All right. So this makes me ask the question, what is needed for, in order for this little boy to succeed? Let's take just one of these ladders on the grid away and see what happens. Without the knowledge of uh, where the juice is and where the cups are and um, that juice is yummy. We have to ask ourselves, could he have brought juice over to the table and had a picnic? Basically, no. And without the skills to walk and to pour and to clean or a way to communicate, could he have made the picnic happen? No. And without the I can attitude, and the no shame, again, his, his roadblocks would have just stopped him. And without the, his mission, his drive to have juice at the picnic, again, it wouldn't have happened. And lastly, if he didn't have a vision in the first place, then he wouldn't have succeeded. But do any of us doubt at all that this little boy was going to succeed? Um, I think he was. And the question is, how important are each of the ladders? Because if even one of them is missing, he couldn't have succeeded. He needed all five. So the first tool that we went through was the leadership grid. And we're going to cover today the five tools of leadership education. So... The, uh, the leadership grid is, is a powerful diagnostic tool. I, I, uh, I love how it gives us a place to start. You can see that, that Tiffany's done an analysis of, of this little boy and his, and his mission to succeed at the picnic, right? Uh, but it's also a way to figure out what next steps are. And when you think about this little boy, you can look at one of those ladders and you can say, okay, this is something that would make all the difference the next time. You know, for instance, you could take the knowledge ladder and you could say, if he knew how to actually clean it up, he knows it needs to be cleaned up or you're, or you're gonna slip on it, right? But he didn't have the, the, that's a skill too. So he needed to know about it and he needed the skill and that, and that could help him, you know, s succeed the next time. You could also look at something like vision and you could say, you know what? That's great that he has a vision for a picnic. Uh, what, what if we encourage him to have a, a vision for a picnic in the, in the outdoors where spilling juice doesn't matter, you know? So there's, there's a, a lot of, a lot of value in looking at your child or the student in your classroom and using those ladders to ask the question, you know, is this child struggling? Is he slipping on the floor or not being able to read the book because he doesn't have the skills? He doesn't have the ability you know, what, what, it, what is the thing that's, that's causing uh, my student or my child to, to struggle? So that's one way that we can use the leadership grid to, to um, create next steps. But one of the most powerful tools that we teach is what we call spiritual eyes. And with spiritual eyes, we have 
uh, another way to diagnose and prescribe, okay? A doctor looks at a patient and says, hey, you know, this person's sick. Let me look at the symptoms. Let me see what's, what's going on. And in that process, they figure out, you know, what treatment to, to, to do next. So the leadership grid is, is, is one of the most powerful tools for that. And then it's corollary the spiritual eyes is, is what helps us to really find those answers that maybe seem um, difficult in the, in the first place. So allow me to, to share with you the source of this. We, uh, we learned from Sinichi Suzuki, who's the famous violin player of the Suzuki method, uh, a master mentor um, in his book, Nurtured by Love. We learn of his experience of having uh, parents come to him and say, can you teach us can you teach violin to our, to our son? He's, he's blind. And in that process of being asked, Suzuki had to step back. He couldn't just say yes. He'd never taught a blind boy to, or girl to play the violin. He had to step back and say, what is it that would be required of me? You know, what, what kind of, of thing can I do to be successful at this task. And, you know, Sir Isaac Newton said that half of the work of solving a problem is, is asking the right question. So we as mentors want to diagnose and figure out what that next right step is. So in the, uh, in the book, Nurturing, um, Nurturing with Love, Suzuki teaches us a, a powerful principle. And I want to read um, a quote from that book, so you can get a sense of, of what a powerful principle this is. He says, yes, I will make little Tichi, I'm not sure how to say this little boy's name. I will, I will make little Tichi see the violin, strings, and bow. He doesn't need physical eyes. I, if I can teach him to use the spiritual ones. My basic, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to make this bigger when I'm doing a quote. Um, my basic guiding principle was thus decided. Later, I could think about the method. That's pretty key. I'm just going to stop right there for a second. Later, I'm going to think about the method. First, to use is spiritualize. I said, let's cooperate and unite all our efforts to open the spiritual eyes of the little boy. So he's talking with the parents, and he says, you know, we can combine a team. We can do this. I asked the parents to be prepared for long, strenuous endeavors and to have the devotion to carry through the resolution to the very last. Thus, lessons began. Even considering that it was for their own child's happiness, Mr. and Mrs. Tanaka co cooperated admir admirably. The anxieties and hardships cannot be put into words, but their dearest wish came true. They put a dot of light in the heart of their son. So that's on page 46 if you have that book and you want to savor in that story a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But that the, think of the power of that story. I don't have to rely on my physical eyes when I have spiritual ones. I will figure out a method once I have the vision that this child can, can succeed. You know, is there a child in your life that maybe needs that vision from you? Because sometimes they have a hard time coming up with it on their own. So I loved how, how the method was, was not the most important thing to him. It was more the sense that I can, I can teach through the, the gift of these spiritual eyes and I can, I, can, I can manage to that. And keep in mind that it, he wasn't doing it alone. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a triad going on with, uh, with you and, and the parents of your, of your mentees and, and also with their creator. So we can be a conduit for bringing about transformation like he did for this little boy. The first two tools on the leadership uh, of, of these five tools help to diagnose and prescribe using our spiritual eyes is the basis of being a good mentor, and we use the leadership grid to figure out um, the roadblock that a student may have. 
And we ask ourselves, do we need to teach them a skill? Do we need to give them vision? So these are the, the foundational tools. The next three tools help make a mentor effective. And tool number three are, is simply mentor skills and mentor abilities. And these compri comprise the art of mentoring. And these can be taught. Mentor skills can be taught. Mentoring abilities can be taught. They can be learned. And honestly, being a mentor is part of our nature because we influence each other. We mentor each other. Everyone is in a mentoring role. And yes, there are several kinds of mentors. Most of the people listening are parent mentors and liberal arts mentors. Um, we do some formal mentoring and informal mentoring. We have eight categories here that there are many skills and abilities in each one of these categories that we mentor you through. If, if you are taking the scholar project training, then we have lessons in every single one of these. In your scholar project training, you will begin to go through these and then Throughout the year, we have a mentor resource page that has many lessons um, about these skills and abilities that we will send you the link for that. Um, the thing that, that I, I'm just going to share one of these right now with you. I just want to jump down to no feel do. Um, Kathy's going to talk about this later in, as you know, a mentor in the scholar projects, but even as parents, um, if we can nail this skill to know our no field do, like every time you go in a classroom, we ask, what do I want my students to know? Um, how do I want them to feel? What is it that I'm hoping they're going to go do? And we, the reason why the projects aren't just a curriculum is because we have a general guideline and it is up to the mentor to nail their no feel do according to their students' needs that they have and where they are on the scholar ladders. And um, pretty soon it becomes second nature. Like my husband and I, we have, we have three college age children who are in our home at this time. It's, a, it's an amazing season for us. And we realized that we have let our formal mentor meetings with them kind of slip. We just you know, we have different schedules on Sundays than they do. And we thought we actually need to re-implement these mentoring sessions with our kids. We just had to switch the day. And the other night we sat down and we said, what does our no field do with our daughter, Melanie? You know, she's 18. And we talked about it and we nailed the no. We need her to know that when she graduates from massage therapy college in 10 months, that two months after that, um, she will be expected to pay rent and to buy her food and to pay for her gas and to pay for her car insurance. We need to let her know she'll be in a space to be self-reliant. We want her to feel emotionally prepared by then. And um, we want her to feel that, that we know she can do this. And we want her to continue doing what she's doing because she's getting there. So, you know, my husband and I, we nailed this before we sat down and had our meeting with her and it, it becomes automatic. This, this is a skill. Figure out your no feel do. This is just one of them. We're going to cover a couple of these um, in, in today's presentation. This, oh, Kathy, you want to go ahead? Okay. Um, I'm going to touch on, on learning environments because these are important ways of teaching that we don't necessarily always think about. But I think that when we learn to harness environment, we can be even more effective than, than if, we, uh, if we just let things happen, you know, in a, in a sort of chance way. Um, so one of our skills as a mentor is to create various environments. And in this first little list, laughing, crying, groaning, singing, dancing, sighing, those seem like very, you know, fantastic learning environments for younger children, but they can be used in scholar phase as well. 
it's amazing what can happen when you uh, encourage freedom, freedom of expression. And I'm not saying that it's always appropriate to do any given one of these. I, I certainly don't want to, to elicit groaning in my lectures, but <laughs> there's, there's something to be said for, um, you know, making, making opportunities for our children to have those kinds of, of environments because they help bring emotion. We connect with material much more solidly when we have a connection to an emotion. Information is usually lost, you know, when we don't have an emotional connection to it. So in a, in a scholar situation, we want to have that emotional environment be a part of it and to be able to teach that, you know, controlling our emotions and being a part of a group and laughing together and even crying together that, that there's things that are learned through those moments that aren't learned in any other way. So our scholar projects, you know, we do our best to create environments where there, there's safety. Um, I, I think, you know, right off the top of my head, I think of our Shakespeare Conquest project, the, the, you know, the very beginning of Shakespeare Conquest, is, is the, the mentor establishes this environment of safety, which allows us to, it, it gives the children permission, our youth, I should say, gives them permission to, to experience something that, you know, maybe doesn't come naturally to them. And we can do this, you know, we can create laughter, we can have it be fun. And we can and we can give them an opportunity to 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 do those kinds of things. Of course, there's more listed on here. Any one of them we could, you know, spend an hour on. And oh, by the way, we probably have a webinar on it that will be available to you as a trained mentor. And uh, and we go to great lengths to try to share with you the things that we've learned over the last 20 years of bringing these environments to uh, to the thousands of students that that benefit from Levy projects. So the, the next part of the mentor skills and abilities on the next slide is, uh, is the, uh, the six keys to personal influence. Now this is content that's taught in the Quest project, which in my very biased opinion is the very best of our projects. And I love it because I've-, I've Every trainer says that about their projects. I know, I know. It's true. <laughs> and I love the other ones and I train in other ones, but Quest is the one where I've seen real powerful, life-changing uh, transformation. I've taught it five or six times and I just can't even tell you how, how it fills my heart to share any part of it. Anyway, the six keys to personal influence are just what they sound like. There are ways in which we can influence others. And if we want to be leaders and we want our children to be leaders, these are the skills, um, well, not the skills, these are the, these are the methods by which we can influence other people. And the power of teaching this to youth is that they have struggles in their own life. They, have, they know friends who are struggling in different ways. And you could say to them after they've learned about the six keys of personal influence, you could say, you know, that friend of yours is struggling, which of the keys are you going to be able to employ at this time in their life? Can you uh, be a good example? Are you able to um, maybe, maybe share with them uh, something powerful in a, in a letter? So these, these particular ways of influencing are, um, are the, the key to being a great leader. We want our students to not only recognize when freedom is taken away, you know, when people are, are heading towards bondage or when they find themselves in bondage. But we want to we create an environment of learning that gives them the permission to go out and stop some of that, to see a cause, you know, worthy of their, of their efforts and to be able to use their, their own personal influence to affect that cause. I mean, in my opinion, that's why we do leadership education. We're trying to help them find their mission and have the skills and abilities to be able to impact the world. And, and these particular ways of influencing are very, very powerful. 
You can learn more about the six keys to personal influence um, and lessons that are in your mentor materials and resources um, page on the website. You know, we're going to say that a lot today, uh, but that's, that's the thing is when you, when you come into the Lemmy fold, you have access to, uh, to a great number of resources. And of course it's up to you whether or not spend the time and energy it takes to, uh, to hone your skills and, and increase your, your knowledge and understanding. And we encourage you to do that. So I'd like you to just think for a second about somebody that you know, that's very influential and, and, and ask yourself, maybe you can write this question down and ponder it later. You know, which of these methods of personal influence are they using? Which one, which one do they, do they do well? Which one do you want to emulate? You know, if you know somebody who's, who's very powerful, you know, through giving service, they can be a mentor to you. They can help you to become, become that person that you want to be who serves without, without ex- expectation of reward or who, or who gives, uh, who gives of themselves um, in, in the most trying of circumstances. So, you know, you can, you can walk away from this webinar with this, with this list and, and make a, a tremendous difference in your life. So, um, okay. we're on tool number four. Yeah. Well, no, tool number got, three. Got still. Superpowers. Okay. <laughs> um, tool number three, the third category in the mentor skills and abilities are the creative superpowers. And these equal your wealth. It's really fun in Pyramid Project because all of our students learn how to, how to make equations. And here's an equation right here for you. Um, these creative powers equal your wealth, and this equals your ability to create. I'm going to go through these one at a time and just give you their definitions. Your personal power is the ability to control your state. So you just have to think about that for a minute. Think about the last time um, you lost control of your state. <laughs> or think about the last time that you nailed it. That it didn't matter what was happening around you. It didn't matter. You stayed true to the state you wanted to be in. And this is personal power. Um, the second one is material power. And this is craftsmanship over matter. And I'll, I just have to introduce this here that Georgic's project um, is largely about material power. Um, it's mastery over um, your body, and that's material. It's mastery over the land, and that's material. Um, you know, every project does something different, but material power is craftsmanship over matter. Knowledge power is the ability to think, the ability to project the ability to see things as they really are. Authority power, is, I, I love, this one is amazing to me. There are two ways to have authority power. One is by position. So you can be in positions of authority like for no other reason than the fact that you have a child, you are in the position of mother or father and you have power in that child's life by virtue of your position. Now, craftsmanship means excellence in something. Uh, you could take two mothers, and both can have the same position, but their craftsmanship as a mother can be completely different. And so authority comes from both ways, craftsmanship and position. Then there's task power. We love this one because we believe that uh, children should start learning task power. Uh, well, definitely control over their time in practice scholar phase. Uh, you know, you get to relearn everything in practice scholar phase that you've learned your whole life thus far. But uh, task power, how many adults do you know who uh, don't, have task power and what kinds of problems does it cause in their life? So we feel really fortunate to start teaching our little 12 year olds task power and anyone in our scholar projects task power. For adults, one of the most important lessons that we teach about task power is to learn how to identify the season that we're in. 
Because if we can know our season, we can know our number one, two, and three focus, and then set up our systems around our season. And once our systems in our home are set up, then it's our, it's just like an ease. We, we can just go through. Sometimes we have a really hard time. Sometimes I think our season picks us and it's a matter of submitting to it. Like if you uh, get really, really sick and you know you need to work on your health, um, it's picked you, <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's just a matter of submitting to it. This is part of task power. Then relationship power, the ability to build meaningful relationships with people. So prosperity equals the creative superpowers. Uh, synergy is the ability to combine the creative powers in order to create. So I, I remember, um, it's really amazing. There's a myth that wealth is your just your assets that can be turned into finances, right? Just your financial assets um, is your wealth, but it's really not true. Brigham Young, one of the biggest colonial leaders in American history, said that he could walk into a man's family cabin and tell in an instant his wealth. And it wasn't from material assets. It was from seeing what they did with what they had. So uh, to, to just give a little story about how all of these things, our authority, power, task, relationships, personal, material, and knowledge, all of these, if you can imagine a circle and all these things are little dots in the, in the circle, um, it's how we can create, it's our wealth. So uh, to give an example, my friend Anelody, she's the one that is the other co-founder of Lemmy. She had a lot of task power she could do you know, the daily things and the chunky time. Um, she had a lot of, um, she had a lot of knowledge and material power and was a good seamstress. So in two weeks, she could uh, sew an amazing, amazing wedding dress. She, she could design it. She could get the materials. She could sew it. She could um, make it fit the one that she was sewing for. And this is how wealth works because she and I have a relationship, I can tap into her entire group of superpowers. Um, this, is, this is just what synergy is. So um, through my relationship with her, she ended up making a wedding dress for my sister. Um, and that was a creation. This is always, these powers right here always precede a creation. So, these are some more of the mentor skills and the mentor abilities that can help us mentor our children because the more we grow in each of these categories, the, the more effective we are. I love how, uh, how the creative powers help us with really the thing that brings us the most joy in life. Because if you look at, you know, whatever it is that brings you joy, uh, there is a very good possibility that that you're, uh, you're creating something, you know, maybe it's your business, maybe you're creating a business or, or maybe you're creating children, you know, they bring you a, a great deal of joy as well as laundry. So there's that. But the, uh, the nice thing about, about learning about these creative powers is it gives us a name for a, a principle um, that allows us to be successful creators. So I love that, that you and Anelody came up with these and, and thank you for sharing them. So our, uh, our fourth tool is insights into human nature. Now, this is, this is really fundamental to a leadership education. We, uh, we study classics in part so that we can understand human nature. Um, they, they teach us, you know, through, through story, through fact, through uh, experiences that we don't have to have personally. Uh, what happens when we make different choices? That's one of the reasons I'm so grateful my children have had at least two years, every single one of them have had at least two years of Shakespeare because he's he's a master at human nature. And as they've you know studied in depth a, a play, they've they've learned some of the consequences of choices um, because he did always show consequences, even though he showed the baser side of life as well. 
But we have um, some fundamental foundational beliefs at Lemmy and we, uh, are, you know, just, I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about, about those so that you understand what they are. Um, the first is this fundamental belief in freedom that no conscience should be forced. So we have a Liber Creed, you can find that on libercommunities.com. And it's, it's a gate, it's a gate through which we, uh, through which we invite you to join us if you're like-minded. Um, education is so fundamentally important, uh, so foundational to our lives that we want to we want to do it in a way that is consistent with this foundational belief that we can um, we can choose, and that includes choosing failure, which is a difficult thing as a mentor to watch. It's it's very painful actually to watch somebody uh, to ch watch somebody choose failure, uh, but sometimes they do. And we don't manipulate, we don't coerce, we don't force somebody to, to do that, um, you know, to do those things that, that they choose not to do. And, you know, that in and of itself is a mentorability that, uh, that takes some, some real fortitude to, you know, gain belief in, uh, in our Lemmy philosophy is, is this, you know, we are what we are connected to. Uh, the the book Joshua Cooper Ramo wrote called The Seventh Sense is a fantastic uh, modern day classic of what all these networks that we're connected to are doing in our lives. We highly recommend it, and uh, and we'll talk about a webinar series that you can obtain to uh, be able to get more out of it than just reading it alone. But the, it's an interesting concept that when we're connected. To people, it changes us. It impacts us. And during our during your training, when you when you come to your your uh, two or three day training, uh, you'll be connected to your trainer. You'll also be connected to the other mentors in your class, and you'll also be connected to new ideas. Um, I want you to to notice how these connections change you. There is there's. There's the synergy that Tiffany already, already talked about with the creative powers, but there's also something else. There's also a strengthening of, of character and a, and a personal transformation that happens when you are immersed with amazing people. I, I really have to say that let me trainings are my favorite place to be. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a, you know, trips to Hawaii. I'm pretty fond of those. But I really, really love to, to be at Lemmy Training because as a, as a person who came for five years or so, maybe it was six, I can't remember, uh, before I became a trainer or the 10 years since then, every single time I've walked away um, different. So um, the, other, the other foundational belief is, is in something that we call the Liber Cycle. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But, oh, I guess we're going to talk about it now. So tell me oh. Kathy, I can go back. Are you still talking about? That's fine. I mean, you go ahead. Cause, no, because are you, you're done with the connection? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Now I'll talk about the liver cycle. Um, yeah, this is the, this is the third uh, piece of tool number four which is all about human nature and how we grow. And this is an expanded version of the Liber Cycle. Many of you who have come to Lemmy Trainings for a long time understand the Liber Cycle, and we wanted to share with you the expanded version of it. So what happens at the beginning when in the cycle of growth, you get a true principle and during the step where a truth is taught and a person decides to live it, in this beginning stage of application, the vision is high and the, desi the desire and call to do it are high. This is the honeymoon phase of the LIBOR cycle. So think back to when you learn something and you're like, oh, I'm so excited, I can do this. A seed has been planted and the assurance that the seed will grow and mature and bear fruit is high. As soon as you start applying the true principle, you realize that the competence is low. In other words, belief that the seed will produce a specific outcome is there, but the abilities and skills to live it haven't necessarily 
been gained yet. The assurance that the seed will bear fruit has lessened and hope is now the driving force because you've hit this wall of ignorance. Um, this is an amazing place to be. This is one of the most important reason for the learning environment of testing. How many of you have taken a test and realized what you don't know? You know, that's an important moment when we learn what it is that we don't know. So if we can teach our children that when this slump hits of, oh my gosh, this is so hard, you know, that along with that feeling um, is, is the hope that now you know where you're going um, because the abilities and skills to live it haven't been gained and we face the ignorance, it kind of feels like we've dropped off a cliff. <laughs> it's like, what? Oh, maybe I don't want this anymore. Some people get off the Liber cycle right here. Anyway, at this point, it challenges the character and several choices have to be made. Are you willing to go through the pain of learning? That's one of the choices. Are you willing to put the necessary time and effort into becoming competent and gaining the skills and abilities that are needed and learning new things so that you can actually live this principle. This is where we face tests, trials, and traps. So I'm gonna give you an example here halfway through. Let's say that a mother learns the principle of holding regular formal mentor meetings with her child. At first, she's excited. She knows how it can increase her child's growth and enhance their relationship. She goes to have the first meeting and apply the principle, and she realizes she's never held a formal mentor meeting. She doesn't know the difference between what makes it formal or informal. She realizes she doesn't know the length of time to hold the meeting. She doesn't know what kinds of questions to ask. She realizes she wants to have her child want the meeting too, but doesn't know quite how to get him on board. She realizes what she doesn't know. This step is so important. Now she knows what she needs to learn. So the learning starts. Her character is challenged because there are tests, trials, and traps. She faces the trap of being too busy. Oh no, another skill to learn. Seasons and time management. She faces a test. She planned on holding the formal mentor meeting with her spouse, but he said he isn't interested. Will she give up or will she hold them alone for now? She faces a trial. Her morning sickness has kicked in and now she's nauseated and hates everyone. Will she still, even energyless and lying on her bed, regularly invite her son in for a formal mentor meeting? and show unconditional love for him, even though she feels miserable. Let's move to the next step, transformation. If you persevere, then it transforms you, transforms you, and now your skills and abilities are also high. All five ladders match at this point. Your vision of the fruit that this seed bears the mission and desire to live it. You now have the skills and abilities and knowledge to do so. Your capacity has increased and you have self-validation that you can do this and other hard things. Now you live it and receive the fruits of your labor. So let's go back to the mother who wanted to hold formal mentor meetings with her son. If she perseveres, she learns the difference between a formal and informal meeting. She learns how to cast vision. She learns how to love unconditionally. She learns how to listen, learns when to share. She makes plenty of mistakes, but accepts that it's part of the cycle. She continues to hold meetings even though she felt sick and she didn't give up just because it wasn't her husband's time to join. Now she has self-validation. Her skills and abilities grew and her capacity has increased. And the fruit, the result is that she feels closer to her son than before. She understands him better. She's less judgmental and afraid. She's okay with his mistakes as she is with her own. He knows he can trust her. 
they are both more self-aware. This is the expanded version of the LIBOR cycle, and this is how we grow. Um, the great part is the cycle then's repeated. The more we understand our natures, the better mentors we can become. So tool number four is all about understanding our natures. Um, the LIBOR cycle teaches us about our natures, and it helps us understand our students. So... Let's get ready for the fifth tool by Before watching this. Before we go on to the fifth tool, can I, can I just share a couple of things? Um, one, one is about the cycle itself. I, I think of it as a spiral because when you are living this new truth that you found, you're actually holding the, the, the mentor meetings, um, you're not the same person anymore. So when the next call comes, you recognize, oh, this is I'm about to go on this journey again. And you do it at a higher level. So you're kind of spiraling up as you do it. And it's also interesting to look at the corollary side of this, which is that if you hear the true principle, you know, you know in your mind, you feel it in your heart, um, that this is a thing that you want in your life. That this is something that you, you know, some change that you really actually want to make. And you hit those, those tr test trials and traps, um, you know, that you don't, if you, if you give up, if you choose mediocrity and go back to, I want a new principle, um, then, then you're kind of choosing the downward spiral, right? It gets harder the next time to trust yourself that you're actually going to follow through this time. And I'm not saying that there isn't room for failure in the, in the application of the library cycle, because I, I certainly can, uh, can that we learn from those failures as well. Um, but we've had a question about what it, what is LIBOR, and it's it's the root word of of free. Okay, so library um, is you know a, a, a one of the words that comes from this root, and it means that we are free in that we can uh, we're educated, right? If we can read, so so the application of the LIBOR cycle in our life is one of the things that that makes us free. And the other thing I wanted to share was that the uh, the example Tiffany used, you know, just I couldn't I couldn't uh, be more more thrilled with the example that she chose because teaching the the parents um, in our communities to do formal mentoring meetings is a, is one of the many things that we want to accomplish as mentors, it'll make our job easier, but more importantly, as students, it'll make them more successful. And I like to share about uh, mentor meetings with my first, you know, with our firstborn children, we, uh, we uh, are testing everything out, right? We, we don't necessarily know what we're doing. And I, I, I took this, this challenge to have these formal mentor meetings that, that I learned from, from Tiffany and Anelody. And I did them very, very regularly and, and, uh, and to great success with my oldest. And I had several peers whose, whose children were, you know, same age range and, and, uh, and their oldest were rebelling. And they would ask me for my advice, you know, like, what do you do about this teenage rebellion thing? And I was just like, I don't know, haven't, <laughs> haven't experienced it. And so this went on and I was kind of like waiting for the other foot to, you know, the other sh shoe to drop, right? I was waiting for my son to become rebellious. I um, mean, he was 17 at the time. I remember this conversation like it was yesterday and it wasn't yesterday since he's turning 27 this summer. Um, I said, so Adam, you know, my friends are, are saying, you know, what do you do when your when your teenager rebels? And, and, you know, you've never rebelled and I just kind of have to ask, why is that? And he just looked at me and he said, mom, I want to be successful in my life. And if I'm going to be successful, I need to listen to you because I know you know more than I do. And I was like, oh, okay then. <laughs> and I know without a shadow of a doubt, it's because we had had a hundred conversations where he was you know, the focus of that time, even with his five younger siblings, uh, that I, you know, regularly had meetings with him and helped him solve his life problems and overcome his many, many 
um, difficulties. He has learning difficulties. And I was able to help him be successful in his life because I knew what he needed because we had that kind of relationship. I'm not promising you that mentor meetings will prevent you from uh, having teens that rebel, but I know in this particular instance that that, that, was, that was the thing that you know, made all the difference for this particular kid. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, so. Pause the video now and watch this 10 minute clip on YouTube. Search for Ken Robinson, Changing Education. Your webinar will continue in about 30 seconds, so please be sure to stop it. All right, thank you. Uh, Tiffany, I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the you know, powerful material that is, is in, that, in that video. Um, if we were in a room together, we'd be able to have a conversation right now. Uh, but I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna share a couple of thoughts that I had and sort of debrief in that manner. I hope you took notes and, and put down your own epiphanies and your own ahas, but I'm gonna just share a couple of mine. Um, when he talks about the current system marginalizing the things that really matter to us, I'd like you to think about that for a minute and ask yourself if the things in your, in your classroom or in your own homeschool um, take into account the things that really matter to our children. It's, it's very difficult because I think as, as educators, we come in with our own expectations and our own feelings of, of uh, I don't know, needing to control things, needing to make things happen the way that we see them happening. And I know that I've found in my life that um, great education happens more readily when I'm willing to let go of outcomes. When I'm willing to ask a question of the student that I don't know how he or she is going to answer it. So as, as mentors, we, we want to create in, in our classroom an environment that says, you know, you know why, does, why does studying the Revolutionary War, the founding of America, this generation of people who were seeped in, in, in the mother's milk of freedom, you know, why does that matter in your life? I'm teaching Key of Liberty next year, and I'll have two of my own daughters in there. And I'm thinking all the time about the first day because I know that the vision I cast the first day will make a huge difference in whether or not those students in my classroom will buy in. So another thing that, you know, just hits me every time I watch this video is his concept of those two stair stairways and, and one's going up and those are the smart people and, and one's going down and those are the, uh, you know, the unintelligent ones who are, who are busy, uh, I don't know, carrying boxes downstairs, right? And I think of this, of this boy, his name was Steve. He was in my, uh, my grade school classes. I went to parochial school and, and uh, you know, got a great foundational education there. I'm, I'm grateful to the, to the nuns that taught me. And this boy had what, you know, wasn't, uh, I don't even think a word back then of, of dyslexia. You could you know, I can think back to the struggles that he had. And I used to help him when he was reading aloud. He sat in front of me and I'd give him the next word because it was so painful. They, they, they required us to read aloud. And the message that he got loud and clear was that he was stupid. I saw him many years after high school and, and he, was a, he was a painter and um, like a paint the walls kind of painter, which, you know, of course is honorable work. I'm not denigrating that, but, but he, he definitely had taken the message that he was uneducable. And we don't believe that. I have two of my own kids that struggle with learning disabilities and processing issues, and we don't believe that they're uneducable. We believe that they are. So we have to make sure that in our own attitudes, 
we don't put um, students down on uh, uh, the downward, you know, the, the downward set of stairs like that. So another, another concept in this video that I think is, is worth pondering a little bit about, and I'm not sure that I have like it completely formulated in my mind, but I'm gonna bring it up because maybe you, uh, you will have it perfectly formulated and, and you can uh, get back to me, right? Um, this, this idea of, of the enlightenment of the mind being the, the uh, intellectual model that you know, he, he references as being sort of in the Kool-Aid. Um, the enlightenment period of time is one of my fav favorite time periods. I think it's fascinating. And, you know, how grateful we are to the people who, uh, who, were, who were the movers and shakers then. But do we want to have our educational methodology stuck in a, a, you know, a couple centuries ago, in the ideas of a couple centuries ago? Or do we want to have a, uh, and do we buy into that, I guess, is really my, my bottom line question. Do we buy into the ideas of those models, uh, you know, of, of what, what the mind is and, and how, how we can think about that? So um, his, his next sort of section, which, in which he talks about, we need to go in the opposite direction of this standardization, this um, one-size-fits-all kind of education, which I think everybody on this webinar is, and everybody watching this recording is, is well aware that we don't. Um, but, you know, what are we doing to help people in the now, like our students who also are distracted by a hundred different things? Um, you know, we all feel it in our lives, the distraction of the many things that pull on us and the many messages that we're getting. And it's, I think, even intensified for our youth, even when we try to keep them, you know, more centered and, and less, uh, less, you know, based in a virtual reality, if you will. And um, I know I'm seeing in my Commonwealth, I'm seeing a, an increase in the number of students with different diagnoses, including ADHD, which he talked about. And I'm just gonna share a quick story about one of them. Um, he's just recently turned 18, so this is his last year with us. And I did a simulation on Wednesday where I uh, had the kids all come into my class um, with a mentor at the door saying, you know, don't, uh, don't say anything, sit down, take a seat, you know, you'll have an opportunity to speak. And, and, I, and I got up and told them that, that our school was going to be closing if the board wasn't convinced by the students' own, you know, own statements that it was worth keeping open. And I didn't have any idea what was going to happen. I have a, you know, a couple really like smart alecky kids and I thought this could go bad. <laughs> this could go really bad. And, uh, and luckily it didn't. It was so, so powerful. But I wanted to share about one of the students. Uh, like I said, he just turned 18 and he has, um, in addition to ADHD, he's on the, on the spectrum. And I, I think he has uh, a pretty severe anxiety and, you know, and is medicated for these for these these uh, conditions. And when he got up and said, you know, I spent two years in a, in a high school and I didn't learn anything. It was terrible. It was, it was like this, you know, very difficult uh, experience. And I've been here for the last two years and I want the school to stay open for other kids because I feel like I not only have I caught up, but I've learned that I can love learning. And it was so powerful. I mean, you could feel the room, just these kids that love him and this acceptance that he felt. It was so powerful. And he came up to me after it was all over and you know, we're out in the parking lot. He came up to me. He said, I wanted to thank you for that simulation today. He said, I've been wanting to say that. So he'd had this experience. He wanted to share it. He's a man of few words. One of his difficulties is, is sharing how he feels about things or what he, what he thinks about things in our, in our pyramid project class as well. So that was, that was really powerful. What are we doing to create this? You are educable. You have, uh, you have genius. Let me help you find it. And, and creating the mentoring. One of the things he said was that the mentors here really care about me and they help me to become. And I'm like, yeah, you bet we do. <laughs> so that's that's you know, those are some of my thoughts. I'm sure your thoughts are are uh, are equally um, 
equally valuable. And, and I, I uh, encourage you to, to think more about the things that Ken Robinson teaches in this and ask yourself as a mentor, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing to, to be a, a better, a better mentor and create the, the opposite of this kind of conveyor belt education that he speaks of. So we have a vehicle for effectiveness for an education that is different for an education that I like to think of it as it's sticky. It really does have the, the, um, the why in it. And we have the opportunity, you know, to, to bring to our kids a project, a project based learning environment that has some genius to it. I'd like to share a couple of the why, why it is genius. I mean, since I didn't invent it, I'm allowed to just say, wow, this is really genius. And, and Tiffany isn't it because it would be self, uh, self congratulatory. Right. <laughs> but it's a, uh, it's genius because it harnesses, you know, it creates the environment where peers want to be noble. And even if they don't exhibit it, you know, their parents want them to be noble. They're surrounded by mentors who want them to be noble. And there's a kind of a peer, positive peer pressure that comes in, in, that, in that experience. And it helps to, to be able to, to have that environment to take the, the kid that just came out of public school or the one who's, who's struggling, put him in that environment and, and watch, him, watch him grow like, like my student Jordan. Um, these projects also are designed to facilitate growth in that leadership grid in those in those scholar ladders so that we can help them to, to, to go to the next rung. You know, I am starting to get a vision that that I have something to give the world. That's great. Let's move to the next rung. What is it? You know, how can we find it? Um, so we facilitate that growth. They're designed to help students, you know, climb those ladders to learn time management because they have 17 Shakespeare plays to watch, read, or listen to. And, and they encourage the ownership of their own education. That was another thing I heard a lot of my simulation was, uh, was ownership in, in their education. It was pretty, pretty powerful. So the third thing that, that these projects do is they develop design genius and a love of the humanities. And when we can see in forms, when we can recognize that we are creators, when we understand humanity and you know, just human nature in general, our own as well as those around us, we're gonna be more effective. And, and finally, they, they have, um, a character component. You know, most education is, is, is kind of devoid of, of character. It's all up here. It's all intellectual. But that human part of us is so important. And we have as one of our founding quotes, I'm going to call it um, George Turnbull from the, the Scottish Enlightenment said um, that education that forms its self-denial and mastership of the passion without weakening the vigor and activity of the mind that that is what real education is, that we're not only engaging our minds, but that we can learn abilities like self-denial, that we can learn to, you know, hold in uh, our passion when it's not meant to be unleashed. Uh, oftentimes, our passion is a powerful tool, but sometimes it's our worst enemy. So these projects help us to be able to do that. Now, we also know the power of community and that, yes, you can teach these projects, uh, you know, in your home. I've known mentors who've done that. I've helped them adapt. I've, you know, personally mentored uh, people who've done that because they don't have the opportunity for community. Maybe they, they live far away from other homeschoolers or, or whatever the situation, they don't have that. But we know that they work best when they are, um, in a community. So like we said at the beginning, we've been building communities for, for 20 years now. And um, when Tiffany and Anelity recognized that there needed to be a different model, that co-ops um, are great as far as, as they go and mom schools are powerful 
in, in bringing the needs of, of a family um, to the community, which, you know, they're both, they're both, they both have value, but we needed a, we needed another kind of, of school form that would, that would allow for um, self-governance to be learned, that would allow for us to strengthen families through our association with other people who are LIBOR, who are, who are desiring freedom and a great leadership education in their homes. And the result of some of that is, is, uh, is that we are developing into, we the adults as well as the students, are developing into people who understand the power of liberty. You know, that, that like back to that foundational belief that we have, um, that we don't force, you know, conscience. We don't, we don't force learning. That those, those kinds of things can flourish in an environment that is designed for them. And a Commonwealth school brings that. Um, some, some library communities choose not to take the Commonwealth form, but many do. Um, but being able to deliver leadership education in a community allows us to get the Greek inheritance of, of intellectual enlightenment um, with the Hebrew inheritance of, of becoming, of being able to study uh, ways that change us, to, that help us to become, because we don't want to be like the sophists who had a great intellectual experience in their education, but then uh, rejoiced in their ability to confuse and, and confound other people. So we, uh, we, we do uh, want to encourage the establishment of new commonwealths, new library communities, whether they're market-based or otherwise. Um, the vision of the, of the people who are founding them is, is what's most important. How can they bring this kind of education to their community in a way that's gonna work? And so we developed the Library Community School Builder I, uh, I co-authored it with Amy Bowler, who's, who's a, a very uh, well-versed um, fellow trainer at Lemmy. And we developed this under the direction of, of Tiffany. Uh, it's, it's a two-part kind of experience. There's, there's online lessons, 18 of them, that teach principles of, of establishing a community, creating the vision, the culture that you want, um, the forms that you're going to take on, like your business form and how you're going to uh, establish your accounting and those kinds of things, you know, the details of it as well. It works you through those lessons and you have the opportunity to, uh, to develop the school that's going to that's gonna move forward this kind of education in your community. It comes uh, with a, a, a set of personal mentoring hours. We we give you at least eight hours, and I know I, I personally uh, have been coaching uh, schools and given them more than that. So we uh, we want you to be successful, and, and we've developed a, a program that, that a project, I should say, that allows you to become the leader while you set up the school and while you uh, develop your own particular vision so, you know, just in general, we, we, those of you who are part of community now, we commend you for building the schools that, that are creating a culture of virtue and, and they're cultivating and, and helping in the development of, of the adults and the, the students in your, in your community. Um, I see evidence of it all the time. I'm fortunate to be able to meet, meet many of the people around the country and and work with work with them in various capacities, but let's talk about um, Kathy. Oh yes, um, I would just love to share um, something that I a Facebook post that I just saw uh, that Olivia Vota um, wrote. But okay, so someone moved away from one of the Commonwealths and she moved back east, and she said, "I'm losing my mind." Not back east. She's in Tucson. Oh, that's right. Well, yeah, she did. But this person said, I'm losing my mind. Oh. I'm moving to Northern Virginia, D.C., and I'm dying to find a co-op that does Lemmy. <laughs> and she says, I need this for my kids. Um, she says, I'm even willing to form my own group, but I do not know how. So Olivia wrote, and she's one of the people that went through the Library Community School Builder. And here's what she said. My name is Olivia Vota. I have felt your pain and frustration. 
We moved to the Tucson area in 2013, and I almost died when I realized there was no leadership education community here. I only knew one other person that knew about leadership education and had tried to do it as best she could on her own. I mourned the loss of my amazing Commonwealth school back in Utah. I'm not exaggerating when I say that it felt like a devastating loss, but at the time, because of some health challenges, I was also not in a position to start a new library school. So we joined a couple of co-ops to try to get around homeschoolers and offer my kids social opportunities, but they fell so short of what I had had in Utah that I just couldn't continue with them. So in March of last year, I finally decided that it was time to take a big leap of faith and start the very first library school in Tucson. I, I want to, I want to talk just a second about the word LIBOR because uh, someone in the chat box did, did ask about LIBOR. And this is a foundational part of leadership education because being LIBOR uh, meant that someone was literate. They could read, they could write. LIBOR was the tree bark that they wrote on. It meant that they could engage in contract. The reason why they engaged in contract was because they owned land. So the LIBOR people, um, owned land, which meant that they could sustain life. Um, they could read, they could write, they were the rulers, they had an education, they were LIBOR. We, how you get there is through leadership education. So you want to be part of a Commonwealth school that is a LIBOR Commonwealth school and has chosen the educational philosophy of leadership education that that's their purpose for education because there are many, many, many philosophies and methodologies and purposes of education. So this is part of what Olivia is talking about. So she said, um, I decided to take the big leap of faith and create the first library school in Tucson. At the time I started making plans with only one other family. I prayed and told Heavenly Father that I could pull this off Shakespeare, Key of Liberty, and a junior program if he would just let me find three more families for a total of five. I told him that 10 would be ideal, but that I understood that that would be downright miraculous. You know, I guess this is touching to me because right now there's a family in Australia, a mom that's calling me. She's got a child that's 12 and she knows that she needs this for her 12 year old. And she says, I can't find anybody else. And I just texted her last night and I told her, if you build it, they will come. And you build it, you know, one of the best places to start is to offer Shakespeare <laughs> and they will come. So here's, let me go on with Olivia's experience. She says, then I got to work. And I started calling the moms that I knew from these two other co-ops we had joined. I posted invites on Facebook to an informal meeting at my house and mined the few people I knew for their homeschooling contacts. Slowly but surely, people started coming out of the woodwork. By our first day of class last fall, we had 20 families, 20. We have some families driving into town for school from one and a half hours north and others from one and a half hours south. We lost a few during the semester, but all for good reasons. We started this semester with 17 and four more families have since joined. As of right now, we are most likely going to hit our cap of 30 families for next fall. This is nothing short of a miracle. I share all of this because if I was able to gather a community together against what seemed like impossible odds, you can too. Your story might look different, but if you really want a library community for you and your family, Heavenly Father will help you. There's a lot more that I can share with you, including important lessons that I've learned along the way. And then she tells her she can call her. And, and she says, one more important thing. I could not have had the success we're experiencing had it not been for Lemmy's library community school builder. Hands down, Lemmy's training and mentoring have made all the difference. I highly recommend you sign up for it. Okay, 
So I, I uh, talked to her this morning, just to, you know, a little uh, oh, yeah. here. Uh, there are 31 families. Um, so their first school year, they ended up ending with 31 wanting to come next year, and they started a waiting list for the 32nd. So that's that's kind of the kind of growth that you just don't hear about. It's very, very exciting. All right. So what do we do in these in these communities, in these liver liver schools? We, we offer three different kinds of, of LEMI projects, or we encourage uh, three different kinds. The first are junior projects. Uh, these are projects that are made by people like you. Uh, I've done a couple of years of kids that are sort of transitioning from love of learning into, into, into scholar phase, and I've created two different projects that, that help with that process. You know, I have the vision of where they need to be when they're 17 and, uh, and I work it into their 10 and 11 year old lives. So I'm excited about this because I can submit those projects to Lemmy. Lemmy will make them available to other schools. I don't have to you know, market them or, or do any of that kind of stuff. They'll put a, a design of them together and, and offer them. So you, what I'm saying is you, if you have a project that works with your core and love of learning students, uh, you know, you can submit those projects and, and be part of that. Our scholar projects are, are the ones that you are probably, if you're on this webinar, coming to experience in a, in a two or three day format. And those scholar projects we're going to spend some time on. And then uh, personal interest projects are those areas uh, that, that are individualized. You remember Ken Robinson was talking about how we need to get away from everybody doing the exact same thing, but, but uh, you know, give them instead the thing that, that really matters to them, right? And so a personal interest project you know, can be uh, anything from you know, dance to fixing a... Uh, you know, rebuilding an engine, right? It doesn't, it, it depends on the kid. So I can't like name all the different personal interest projects, but we encourage our students to do those things that, that matter to them and are gonna help them in their growth. So we're gonna go through these different kinds of projects. Let me talk about this one for a second. Yeah. Kathy, we're super excited because this is our first year for like about 18 months we've been putting this together. Uh, so. A junior project is a thematic unit focusing on inspiring students to one, fall in love with learning um, and core values. It's created by the library community members, that's you, and you can submit them to junior project submissions on our website and it will take you through. This is if you wanna co-publish them with us so that all the other communities can also have access to them. So we have an incredible designer who puts it into a beautiful package and then um, it, it will be made available so that other schools can go in and pick a junior project or they can create one. So this is, this is just, we are so thrilled about this. We're so excited about this. Um, and I'm going to share Tiffany really quickly that um, one of the, one of the many amazing things I've learned from you is is the importance of, of seeing, you know, these, these young kids as going through both core and love of learning at the same time. And that we're teaching our little tiny infant babies to love learning as well as, as well as our 10 year olds. So I loved the merging of those two, of those two phases of learning, if you will, into, into one, it changed the way I approached my, my children in their, in their, early years. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's, we, we just don't want to have one without the other. Okay. Let's go to the next. Anyway, anyone who's interested in this, we have a link. You can, you can either email us or go to our website, but we have a junior submission link and it's super easy to submit um, what you have. So, so uh, there are some of you out there like Kathy who created already several that are perfect for this. Okay, so we say, oh, people are doing the happy dance. Yay. <laughs> it makes me happy. This is like, this, this is so fulfilling to me that we are ready to make this happen. I, I love watching what happens in our school. I went up to someone last night in, in our school who does a night summit. It's one of my son's favorite, favorite activities. He won it last year. Like they, they make these amazing uh it's out of duct tape and 
cardboard, but basically he made a sword, he made a shield, he made a helmet, and they go into this big, huge trampoline area, and they fight, and um, anyway, there's these princesses, and there's these knights, and it's this big five-hour shindig, and it's, you know, not very expensive, and it's, the, uh, she's made an amazing experience, and there's no reason why um, it can't be happening in all of our library communities, you know, and so I asked her, I said, please submit that. Have you written it up? Have you written your coursework that the boys had all year long? She's like, no. And I'm like, write it up, write it up, <laughs> send it in because it will, my son has loved your class <laughs> so much. Please write that up. Please send that in. There's going to be other boys who, um, it was a boys class. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm just so excited. She's going to send it in. So <laughs> Okay. It's also an example of that we are uh, who we are connected to uh, in action, you know, that, that we, can, we can each learn from each other and, and I don't know, not reinvent, not reinvent the wheel. Yeah. So as I said, the personal interest projects, you know, they really are uh, individualized to the, the students. Um, the, the purpose is for them to focus in one area, maybe uh, also learn another skill set, which is the ability to to find a mentor, you know, to, to get somebody who's an expert in that, in that thing to help them. I, I know a, a friend of mine whose daughter just loved knitting. Is it knitting or is it, I think it's crocheting. She just loved crocheting. Like she makes the most intricate things. She was like eight years old making these crazy intricate uh, crocheting things. And by the time she was about 11, they moved into an area where that where this uh, was a little bit more common than it is in San Diego. I don't know why people aren't crocheting here, but anyway. Um, and she found a mentor that taught her like everything from the shearing to the, you know, to the creating of the yarn that's spinning. I was trying to remember the word, you know, to the spinning of the yarn. I mean, the whole process, you know, how fabulous is that? And I think one of the biggest impediments to having personal projects um, that are meaningful is not that the kids don't have personal interests, but that they're so busy that they don't have time to pursue them. So as parents, we need to be, you know, the ones who implement these, they need to be uh, driven, you know, by the student and, and supported by the, by the family for personal growth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, oh, we put a link in the chat box for those of you who want to go over and look at what it takes to cement the junior project submissions. And we can't emphasize enough the importance of supporting your children in their personal projects. It, oh, it just brings so much, so much fulfillment. My little 12 year old, his is Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that St. George built a Ninja facility. So he wow. called the grip and it, he loves it. It is so fulfilling to him to become an athlete. And, and so our, our children thrive when we will facilitate their interests. Let's talk about Scholar Phase and Scholar Projects for a minute, Kathy. <laughs> so another, another uh, you know, thing I'm so grateful for that, that Tiffany and Nellity did was they're the ones who broke down Scholar Phase from this incredibly inconceivable idea that you could take a 12-year-old and, uh, and end up with a scholar who studies all day long. And, they've, and they, they broke it down into these stages within the phase. So it starts with practice scholar, and that's when they kind of are hitting puberty usually. Um, they're usually around 12. I've had two of my six kind of hit it more like 11. They were, you know, they were just kind of had the self-government and stuff to, to start um, at least one project at that age. Uh, but but generally speaking, it's about 12. Sometimes it's not till they're 13 or 14, but this is where they're practicing being a scholar. It doesn't look like consistent effort and energy um, every day. Um, in practice scholar, we're one of the one of the abilities we're teaching and, and focusing on and, and harnessing all of the above is initiative and and helping them to see that when they take initiative to work towards their goal they're gonna they're gonna have that fabulous feeling of, of success. So the next stage within the phase is apprentice scholar. And here we're, we're uh, engaging them in something that is inspiring, you know, to an, an, a, a mentor who inspires them to submit. Okay, so that's the big ability in, in apprentice scholar. 
there's there's less uh, incentivizing going on in in a, in apprentice scholar and they're learning more about the power of submitting to a mentor. And uh, one thing that I've that I've learned uh, as what I what I pretty much believe to be a, a fundamental truth is that we as the mentor have to also learn submission in order for us to be successful in this stage in the phase. So you can take that uh, for what it's worth. Maybe you're already fabulous at submitting to a mentor, but maybe like some of us, you're a little uh, harder to find it harder to submit. But that that is one of the most valuable things I learned in in, in the beginning of my journey uh, teaching apprentice scholars is uh, is that their submission was mirrored by my submission. The next one is self-directed scholar. We have a, a project that is um, designed to help students to go into that and create their own life projects to be able <coughs> excuse me to take that principle that you can you can create a, a relationship with a mentor or several mentors who can help you to achieve the goals in your own life. And then um, the final part of, of scholar phase is mentored scholar. This normally looks like something like an apprenticeship or a, uh, or a college or, or something of that nature that's more formal. And um, it's, this is when they're launching into their own life. And each of these are, are you know, achieved line upon line. We are, we are growing scholars. We're not expecting them to turn 12 and be scholars all of a sudden. Yep. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about scholar projects for a minute. Um, scholar projects facilitate scholar phase uh, where they accumulatively have spent hours and hours gaining a depth and breadth of knowledge and learning. And in many ways, um, through books, through music, through conversation, through um, gardening, through um, the hours and hours of, of learning and being on the library cycle. So a scholar project, the focus is moving up the leadership grid and teaching the student how to think, how to feel. We're gonna talk specifically again about design genius and the humanities in a minute. Um, it's a leadership education philosophy and methodology and this webinar right now lays the foundation of the philosophy. It's about the interconnectedness of all things. Um, the scholar projects incorporate the liberal arts and the Lemmyisms and scholar skills. I'm not sure we cover the Lemmyisms here, but if anybody wants a poster of them, you can email us because they're they're simply some of the again they they're like um, being a homesteader versus a squatter, or a Lemmyism for the mentor is I know my role and I know my subject my student, they're, they're just different parts of the principles that, that we follow. So we've got an incredible poster that, that Dion Schetz made for us. I want to move on to this part right here. This is the Lemmy Continuum. So this is a, this shows the scholar projects and how they can take someone from a practice scholar all the way up to self-directed scholar. Um, usually you don't go into mentored scholar until you have an apprenticeship or until you're in university um, and you're going into depth in your the area that you feel called to go into, into because it's part of your mission. So we have here, can I use the little cursor? We have here the practice uh, scholar projects right here, Shakespeare Conquest, Key of Liberty, Georgics project, and then we have the transition projects, Pyramid, Sword of Freedom and Hero, then we have the Apprentice projects, the Quest 1 and 2 and 3, and then we have the Self-Directed, which is Edison. And of course, you see here on the top, the Adult Scholar Projects, Family Foundations Scholar Project, we'll talk about that, and we talked about the Library Community School Builder. Um, I think it's important to understand that one of the basic principles of leadership education is that we individualize things when necessary to the student. For instance, Kathy mentioned that her children took Shakespeare Conquest at least two years each. 
Um, my two daughters took it two or three times. I have a son who took, uh, now they took it along with other projects. I have a son who took Pyramid Project three times along with other projects. He uh, has the mind of a scientist and just being able over and over and over again to learn about equations, to learn how to follow a line of logic, to learn how to, um, he, he just really thinks outside the box, you know, and the interconnectedness of all things. And um, so it, that was him. And like the Georgics project, I want my son to do the Georgics project many times, my little 12 year old, I want to, you know, anyway, so these, it's going to be different for every child, but basically uh, Key of Liberty and Shakespeare Conquest are a great place to start a 12 year old. In my opinion, so is Georgics, but if in your school it's being offered to the 14 and 15 year olds, then it might not be right to put a 12 year old in with that group unless that's the group that he fits with. Sometimes you have to look at also the emotional. It's kind of like Ken Robinson said, you don't want to categorize everybody just by age. That seems so ridiculous. But sometimes the phase that they're in and the talents that they have. So use your spiritual eyes to, um, to use the Lemmy continuum wisely. Yeah, and I'll just mention Tiffany here because I, I think it's it bears repeating this individualization to your your students, you know, that these are stage-based projects. They don't have to be taken sequentially. Um, one of the, you know, the things that's nicely taken, you know, sequentially is to have Key of Liberty before Sword of Freedom. But in our own school, that wasn't possible for some of the kids because we don't have a big enough school to offer, you know, both at the same time. So, like, you know, think of it as, as, I need to figure out what stage my kid is in, you know, you, you using your spiritual eyes, the mentor using their spiritual eyes and coming to the, to the best placement for that child, given that not every group is large enough to, to offer them all every year next year. I mean, just as an example, I want you to see that there's a, there's, you know, ideal and then there's real, uh, we're losing a, a set of older scholars who are moving on to, you know, college and, and what have you. And so our our next year lineup looks like all the ages taking um, Key of Liberty together. So it'll be a one room schoolhouse where I as the mentor have to adapt so that the older ones have more leadership roles so that those who are a little further along in the continuum have have a, you know, identifiable ways for them to grow while I'm still serving the, tw the 12 year olds. So there's, there's those, those. And, and just to touch on that, it's very possible to, to do that, to have practice and apprentice in the same group. It's just, you better be a darn good mentor <laughs> to be able to identify the different abilities. I mean, I mean, I'm real, I'm saying that for reals because the very first time we taught the very first scholar project that was made, uh, it had not yet been discovered the difference between practice and apprentice. And it was because of that, that Anelody and I um, found such a difference because the students, I had 20 students between 11 and 18. So it was a lot of work to individualize right. <laughs> according to their needs. So it's not ideal. It really isn't. Um, well, but I, I do think it's easier to bring in older scholars uh, and individualize up to yes. them than to bring in younger scholars. That's just been my experience. It's so true, completely. But I just want people to know who don't, you know, who don't have these enormous communities that you use the continuum to meet the needs of your, of your students and your families. Yeah. When we moved to St. George that year, they were only offering Quest 3, not Quest 1 and 2. So my daughter took Quest 3 before Quest 1 and 2. And luckily the mentor knew that her writing ability had not gone through quest one and two yet, you know? So she was jumping into the, the level of writing in quest three, but they understood. And then when she went through quest one and two, she was different than the quest one and two students because <laughs> she'd had quest three. Um, every scholar project climbs the scholar ladders and in the, uh, 
training packet. If any of you are taking the full training, then you will be sent a training packet. And you can look in there for several of the projects and some of the things that they specifically have on the scholar ladders. Um, this shows some of the key ones. I think that, oh, there we go. So you can just kind of look right there specifically for Key of Liberty. When you say key, you're talking about the Key of Liberty Project. Yep, Key of Liberty Project. So vision, it gives the vision of God, self, country. The mission is citizenship. One of the abilities is self-discipline, skills in writing and presenting and memorizing, um, knowledge of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, history. These are, I mean, this is just a very general but specific about Key of Liberty. I have asked one of our mentors to share about uh, her class. These are, these are her students. This is Camille McCausland and Angel Navalu's students in Georgix. <laughs> um, you can see this picture, right, Kathy? Yep. Yeah. Will you unmute Angel? Oh, oh, so cool. Yeah. So <laughs> I asked Angel Navalu to prepare um, some thoughts for us about how these students went up the scholarship ladders in Georgix. Hi, Angel. Can you see me now? Yes. Oh, good. So one of the students in particular is right in the center. He's in the kind of mustard color pants, Noah. Noah started out, I would say, at the bottom of the ladder. <laughs> I love him, and I'm going to be honest. Well, it was halfway through the semester when I finally approached his mom to ask her, what more can I do to help? Um, he just wasn't handing in as many papers. He wouldn't talk in class and he didn't seem very interested. And I'm like, how do I inspire this kid? And when it was then that I found out he was going to a private school four days a week and coming to Commonwealth on Wednesdays. So all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, because he still wanted to do Commonwealth, but his mom had wanted him to have this other school experience. And it's a school where he's being graded and it's a, a college prep school. And so that was taking his priority and with a, a lot of work. And so, of course, on Wednesdays, it was more like I'm coming here because this is where my favorite friends are and I'm not really invested. Well, I still I felt like um, our subject, Georgix, mattered. And I became more and more passionate as the year went on. This was my first year teaching it and I was new to it. But as I began to look at the principles and listen to William DeMille's um, recorded audios, I like my mind just blew up on how all the seven principles and seven results of Georgics are freedom applied. It's how to develop freedom on a personal level, the micro, meso and macro levels of our society, which is personal, family, community, and then larger extended community national or international it's really the steps of freedom and it just ties so well into um our lifestyles and the, the religious beliefs of these kids and everything that i was super passionate and i was wanting to find a way to hook noah so it came to a point in we were talking one day about personal projects essentially i wanted to get to know what all the kids were doing in their private life to then try to draw upon those and apply Georgic's principles. So they could see the class as not being a separate experience, but how these principles and results could benefit what they were personally interested in. And when Noah brought up that he and another Commonwealth boy would get together and they practiced music, he played the guitar and they were both working on um, guitar duets and learning to sing. And I said, what do you wanna do with that? What's your vision? And he said, well, I wanna be able to be paid to play the guitar. And I was like, awesome, let's talk about how to do that. So we interrupted the class lecture so that I could just focus on his passion and draw the principles and apply it to him. And I asked him if he knew anything about the other uh, mentor in our class, Camille McCausland, who does not brag about herself and does not draw attention to herself. And she's a musician. So I said, Camille, how long have you been a musician, musician, you know, and, and she's in her 60s. So she said probably it was something like 56 years of experience. <laughs> and so I just started to list. I asked her questions about, do you know people who promote musicians? Do you know people who train musicians? Do you know people who pay musicians? You know, so listing all these things on the board. And I turned to Noah and I was like, this one lady 
who's a mentor and, and you you have connection with, look at what she could give you access to. And his, he was like, I had no idea because she's so quiet. You know, I said, do you need help with this? Do you need help with all of these things that she had listed? And he was like, yeah, yeah. I got to flip my screen. I don't know if this will lose you or you can still see me. Can you still hear me? We can still hear you. Okay. I just needed to go to my notes. So what we started to do was map out a plan on the board for Noah. And we first, um, so I was going for vision, how to expand his vision. When he said his interest was to get paid to play um, his music in public, then I started to list all the places in public where I knew he could play right now as a teenager. We took our group to a Saturday's market at a theater area called Tuacon in St. George. And I introduced him to the woman in charge of arranging musicians for that Saturday's market. I just walked him right up to her. He didn't even know what was going on. I just grabbed his hand and said, come on, I want to introduce you. So I introduced him and I tell the lady, this is Noah. He's a musician and he would like to play at the Saturday's market. <laughs> he looks at me like, what are you doing? And I said, I am bridging. I'm brokering services for you. This is my job as your mentor. So she got his information and they exchanged. He got hers so that he, she said, I would love to have you come and play. And he just couldn't believe it. You know, that all he had to do was just share his dream in our class. And all of a sudden he had his first, his first gig. Um, when he, from sharing <clears throat> all the possibilities, uh, his, his vision grew for sure. He thought it was something that as a, as an adult, he would do. And we helped him to see how he could do it now. What did he, he learned about his mission was how much music is valued in our community. We talked about that. We showed that um, when we were at the marketplace, having live music adds value to the events and venues around town. And it's really a highlight for people who love live music. The character traits and attitudes that he developed was that he became more vested on with our class. He really started to show up prepared. He handed in and completed all of the requirements, even catching up on the things he had missed or that were late assignments. He took initiative and he started to express gratitude for the support of his mentors in our private mentor meetings. His mom said that he was really enjoying Georgia's. He became super interested also in entrepreneurship, which is one of the Georgix principles. And he then for our spring semester, he prepared a bunch of bath bombs for our marketplace experience. He got the recipe online because he knew because um, he was paying attention in class when we talked about marketing. He knew that when we had a marketplace on Georgix at lunchtime, the people with the money were going to be the moms, the moms that were at Commonwealth. So he created. <laughs> He created a product that appealed to them, not just something that he would like or boys would like. He knew moms will be there. They love this stuff. And he sold out. He sold every one of his products. Do you said he made fat bombs, right? Fat bombs. Yeah. Like the salts, Epsom salts that are fragrance and you oh, put them in your bath. Salt bombs. Yeah. Bath, bath bombs. Okay. Bath bombs. Got it. Anyway, that's good. Thank you for clarifying. And also when we took him to the Tuacon marketplace, we showed him how um, he could have a booth there and also talk to the organizer that signs up vendors. And she said she would be willing to give him a discount on the rate of a booth because he's a teenager and a student. And she would love to support um, adolescent entrepreneurs. So that was another opportunity for him to get out in the public yeah. and to do that. He was super excited. The skills is that um, he learned how to approach an organizer of an event and ask for the opportunity to perform. He also started practicing that he needed to develop a musical repertoire that would last 30 minutes. He, he got the mindset instead of just getting together to jam with his buddy, they started talking about how many numbers they would have to know memorized without music so that they could do a 30 plus minutes of continual music in a public setting. He also learned the skill of how to ask mentors for ideas and resources. He found out that just between his two Georgics mentors, Camille had 56 years of music performance knowledge and Angel has a network in the community that blew his mind. I know people. And so he learned that. And, and then finally, the knowledge on the latter scale, he learned that there were venues in our little town for teens to perform. There was even a podcast um, that's based here. 
where he could perform on the podcast and be interviewed. And that would give him a social media reach where then he could continue to probe those followers through Facebook and Instagram. We hooked him up with that contact. He found there were live marketplaces, local restaurants who look for talent and a monthly city festival that's always looking for talent. He learned that teens who take initiative are welcomed with open arms and assisted on their journey. So it was a really fabulous experience. And in our final interview, I asked him what was his favorite part of Georgics. And he said the entrepreneurship and the support that you gave me with my passion. And I have to tell you that that was a highlight of the whole year for me to have that conversation and to look back and think, here's the kid who I thought didn't care about the class, wasn't interested. And honestly, he, he, that just shifted when I went to his mom to find out what, what the roadblock was. So that's my woot woot story for today. That's a fabulous story. Thank you, Angel. That is so amazing. You know, if you think of Georgix as just a, a gardening project, you, uh, you are obviously missing the power of transformation. That's, that's an amazing story. And obviously, uh, Angel is a master mentor. Uh, grateful to work with her. What a, what a, what a, what a, what an outcome. Mentor payday for sure. Good job. <laughs> so we, uh, one of our ladders is skills. And in uh, our, uh, our projects, we have built in these, these skills listed on this, on this slide as things that we are trying to help them to achieve and become, you know, to be able to do these things, have them in the, have, have these skills in their repertoire. Uh, we have a, a little phrase that we use. We want them to read like a lawyer, write like an author, compute like a mathematician, speak like an orator and think like a philosopher. And, uh, and I've seen it happen again and again that they do. We, uh, I'm going to focus on reading. You can see the, the, the picture of Ben Bowler here. This is Amy's son, Ben. I think he's 14 or 15. I can't remember. And he is sitting in front of a pile of, well, two piles of, of books that represent the books that are read in the Lemmy continuum. Now, keeping in mind that different um, mentors might substitute out a book here uh, to meet the needs of their students or whatever. It's representative, um, you know, and maybe not every, uh, every kid takes every scholar project, but if they do, that's the kind of volume of reading they do. <laughs> and it's not, of course, about volume. It's about the kind of books that will change you. Uh, coming face to face with great, uh, leaders and and change brokers of history, having having the opportunity to read and 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 grow from from the likes of of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and and Patrick Henry. I mean, just as as examples, uh, the uh, the skill of reading is is grown. We become literate, you know, for most for most people at a fairly young age. I, I don't know about you, but I had several late well okay all my children were late readers and to watch them go from barely fluent in their love of learning years to being able to read difficult you know 600 page um, biographies for instance and to have them transform them is a is a powerful testament to me that exposing them and encouraging them in in reading great classics is, is time well spent. But I, I just want to add that in addition to the skill of reading, uh, we have the opportunity to not rely only on the classics, you know, as, as valuable as they are, you know, reading about, writing about, and, and discussing classics is, is, a, is, a, is a great education. But if you think back to Ken Robinson's video, it's not enough. It's not the only thing they need. They need to have interaction with a group. The simulations we provide, the the, the projects, the um, you know the, the plays in Shakespeare and classical acting, those kinds of experiences grow an emotional and social intelligence that uh, can't be gotten any other way. So we're providing an opportunity to to develop skills, yes, but these projects also grow them 
in ways that that you just can't imagine. If you haven't seen a 12 year old go from, uh, you know, just being exposed to Shakespeare to performing in their first play, you haven't witnessed a uh, true growth and and a beautiful form of it. But you will, I have a feeling. Uh, but these skills are are valuable. And in the process of of experiencing these classics, being inspired by great mentors, and having these these simulations and 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 different group activities, we're providing an education for you know both the mind and the heart. We're not only going for the intellect here. We want them to become the kind of people who who care, you know, who who are who are not apathetic to the ills of the day, who who care about individual people and see service as as a way of influence and that they use that influence for the good. We we want to have them understand that they have a role, that their their mission in life is to serve humanity and to make a difference. You know, that that, that difference is gonna be unique to you. And, and that it's okay if you don't look like another person in, in the way you go about doing that, but being able to analyze where to put your efforts to, to see uh, through the, your ability to see in forms, to see how things are structured and whether there's a way to improve that, 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 that being able to identify patterns in history, uh, patterns in, in families or patterns in, in the community you know, those are all forms related uh, skill sets that that develops a, an education for the for the mind and for the heart. We, we don't, you know, as important as facts are, they can Google that. Right. Uh, we want them to have a, a place to hang those facts. We want them to ha have critical thinking skills, obviously. But we also want them to be the kind of person who uses that knowledge that they've gained and, and those insights into human nature that they've developed to be able to impact humanity and to really actually care, to be able to take their passion and, and affect others and be able to collaborate with others to achieve great things in their life. And, and that's what I've seen over and over again. Okay, here's the result <laughs> of, of Scholar Projects. I'm so excited. <laughs> One of my, we've mentioned him a couple of times, Joshua Cooper Ramo. Uh, last year, we discovered a book that he wrote, and we, um, it was about, a, what, a year and four months ago, we held a, a mm -hmm. summit with the leaders of the library communities and um, those that they recommended, and we went through the 11 chapters, and um, it, was, it was really a fantastic experience because, first of all, the book is written by someone who probably has a different paradigm than most of the people who were at the summit. And so, um, like, just even from the get-go, we would have the feedback coming in, this book makes me so mad, or um, there's, like, the emotional response to, to this book was, was amazing. So I had to coach, I had to coach um, these leaders through learning from someone who has a completely different world experience than any of us have, have had, and he has impact on a a uh, world level on to many nations. Um, he 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 sits at the you know in places where kings are listening to him and presidents are listening to him. He just has he has a different whole experience. But he was talking about what's going on in the world and about an ability. He said there is an ability that we all need. And as I read the book. I'm like, I need to um, discuss this with, with my peers. I need to discuss this with those who have influence on our families and on our kids, and I need to hear from them. So I knew as part of the summit that I wanted to, because there were like 120 of us in the summit, so how do you hear in a discussion from everyone you can't? And so we created this format <laughs> where, um, we could read each other's notes and the notes were taken in four different categories. Um, like what words did you look up or, or what did you look up? What concepts did he talk about that you had to look up because you either didn't know it or you were more interested in it and what quotes made a difference to you and what, you know, 
anyway, it was amazing. Every time my, the, the submissions went in and I read every single submission from every person in that summit. And so my experience grew and everyone had access to um, each other's thoughts. So it was, it was really an amazing experience. This is a, the Liber Summit. We actually have it as a gift for those who, who get the Family Foundation membership. They get access to, to that whole summit, the webinars and, and um, the, the writings that all of the leaders wrote. But here's what Ramo says. This is the author of the book, The Seventh Sense. He says, we find our future in the grip of two groups. One ignorant of networks, the other ignorant of humanity. The only answer then is to educate ourselves. This is what we're doing. This is what you're doing. This is why you're here, because you feel called to educate yourself and your families. He says, quote, more technical knowledge is, of course, essential, but I don't think it's likely to be where we come up short. I just, I found this totally interesting. I never knew that, like, it, this was kind of shocking to me. So I don't think it's the technical knowledge where we'll come up short. I don't think it's a shortage of bolt heads that will doom us. Rather, given the unique pressures of what is ahead, it is our human side that may let us down. So, here he is letting us know the need for the development of our human, compassionate, wise side that knows the difference between good and evil and does something about it. So he also knows, though, that we still need both. We cannot stay free if we are ignorant of the networks and the power they're in and how to use them. That is why we have to develop design genius and this is what the scholar projects do, both. It's so important to develop design genius that it even impacts governments. Ramos says, quote, to educate and deploy masses of people capable of such transcendent design genius will mark a difference between nations that succeed and those that fail. So what is design genius? Design genius is the ability to see patterns. Um, all of you uh, Pyramid Project teachers, the purpose of Pyramid Project is to teach the development of seeing patterns. Patterns, patterns, patterns in every category of life, in every situation. Um, that is one of the main thrusts of Pyramid Project is developing this piece of design genius. Patterns. Okay, the ability to see patterns, connections, structure, cause and effect. We can't get better cause and effect than Shakespeare. You know, we, we, we just can't get better cause and effect because he, at least on human nature, um, if someone acts like this, and this is the cause, here's the effect. If somebody acts like this, this is the cause, here's the effect. Um, that's just on human nature cause and effect. And the kids are just thrown into this, like immersed, immersed in this. And then they take key liberty and cause and effect um, in war and in principles of government and in human rights. And I just, okay, this is design genius. Um, the ability to understand the statesmanship matrix, those who take um, library community school builder and those who take quest three goes into the statesmanship matrix. It's the ability to see forms, platforms, systems in every category possible. Design genius has many applications. A person with design genius might apply it technologically and be able to hack into systems such as your bank or Amazon, <laughs> or they might build a platform such as Snapchat. A person with design genius might apply it to education and use technology and the personal touch to deliver education in a way that's never been done before. That's what we're doing with um, the Family Foundation Scholar Project. We're using technology to deliver weekly lessons specifically mentored from Lemmy, and it has all of these principles in it, and the personal touch 
of an in-classroom friend mentor who's mentoring the class through the material. Um, okay. A person with design genius might apply it mechanically to machines and devise a way to get clean water to nations where the number one cause of death is dehydration due to unsafe water. A person with design genius might teach kids to build bombs with basic household items. A person with design genius without the humanities aspect. Well, design genius without the humanity aspect is neutral. That is why studying the humanities is equally important. Ramos says of many of today's young, quote, their very fluency with the norms of a network age is not yet matched with comprehension of the language of philosophy, of history, and even of tragedy. I think about second semester pyramid project. My daughter, Lara, you know, at one point we had Georgics combined with pyramid and we didn't have that second semester of pyramid project where they're studying specifically philosophers and they're taking um, a piece of philosophy from, from a major philosopher and they're comparing it to their core book. They're following the line of logic. They're finding the assumptions. They're seeking to understand it. Then they're trying to figure out how it fits into their paradigm. Um, it makes them unafraid. This is what I told our, our leaders last year when we read Ramo. I said, your children would not be afraid to read his book. Though your children who've had Pyramid Project um, would not be as angry as you are because they have learned how to read um, from someone else's worldview and not take it personal. <laughs> They, they, they learned this. Some of us who grew up in public school, uh, sometimes it makes us afraid to work with someone of a different worldview and to come to a synergy with someone of a different worldview. And um, so it was amazing to watch us come together and, and go through uh, and learn from, from this amazing, amazing person. Okay, let me, let me keep going here. Okay, so there, um, every single scholar project teaches both design genius and the humanities. And so uh, if, I'll tell you what, if we were in person right now, I would ask for shares from someone from the Georgics class to tell us how it teaches design genius in the humanities. I would ask someone from Quest, a teacher from quest to tell us how does this teach design genius how does it teach humanities i would ask one of you who teaches key liberty to share and we could we could just sit here and weep together at the stories about how the kids are changing and how they are developing both of these and through the uh, this technology that's that's not possible we were really glad that we had Angel be able to share with us about one of the classes, but these are the re the results of the scholar projects. Um, let's go on. We're getting down to the last thirty minutes of being together. <laughs> um, Kathy, oh, you're muted. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you for sharing about that that summit. That really was a powerful. Uh, powerful and amazing experience uh, to just, you know, sh experience that with, with other people. I, I vote we do it again. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Anyway, um, I, I think one of the things that I got from that book was that we have, um, yeah, been teaching that all along, but he gave us a piece that we didn't connect to the projects which is this tremendous, the tremendous power of, you know, the internet kind of networks. When you read that book, it really does change, you know, your ability to see forms and how they relate to, uh, how they relate to the, the, the networks and how those networks change us and, and the gates that are in those networks that you never really think about. So uh, yeah, it was, a, it was an amazing eye-opening experience, one of my new classics for sure. So we've talked about these, these five tools of, of leadership education and, and how we, you know, at Lemmy help you to, to develop them. 
Um, and I'll and I'll start out by saying that we we do believe they can be developed. I, I'm not a mentor who believes that you have to be the guru at the top of the mountain, um, that these things can be uh, taught and that they can be learned and we can, you know, continue to grow in our mentorship. And really it's a journey that never ends. Uh, we, you know, if we choose not to let it end, we can continue to increase our, our knowledge that we can apply and, and to be able to do that. And I want to talk about your role as, as the mentor in your classroom. If you're coming to the three-day training, we assume you're doing that to, to teach, uh, to teach one of the projects. If you're here, just find out what, finding out what we're about. That's, that's awesome too. We, we, uh, would love to to train train you in a project one day, but you bring to your classroom your own individual no feel do. You look into the eyes of your students. You find you go you do like Angel did, and and you go to their parents and you say, "Hey, I see your your son's struggling. Is there anything I can do to help?" And you you know you you do a little investigative work to know who they are and and to hear the voices that they listen to. Um, there's, uh, there's much to be said for, for the power of that, but you come to your classroom with your, your own no feel do. And then you start to ask yourself these questions. What do I need to do in order to accomplish that? The manual may say this, but you and your mentor heart know that that's not what you need to do. It's not the way to get your particular students, um, to, you know, fulfill your own no feel do. So have the, have the confidence to do that. You also are going to ask questions like, what content should I include and what should I leave out? We, uh, we may have had, you know, 25 classes before you being taught by 25 different mentors who took that same content and, and individualized it. I, I sometimes, and I totally understand this frustration, but I hear a frustration from our mentors you know, why we don't give you the lectures? Why don't we give you the content? And it's because we all know from our own experience, you know, I hate to tell you, but I complained the same thing the first time I taught a project, <laughs> um, that we know that until you make the lecture to meet the no feel do in your classroom, it's not going to be yours. You're not going to own it. And, and, your, and your students are are not going to have the same benefit, even though that lecture might have been good. If it was somebody else's lecture, you don't own it. Own it, and, and it's really important to to own your own your own lectures. So, you know, another question you might ask is, how can I make this more engaging? You know, I I know that there's a certain level of I'm just going to call it entertainment that we have to bring to our our classrooms. We have to find ways to engage them where they're at and 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 help them want the information and this is my final question always should chocolate be involved because sometimes it just should be but you know that's just me so i'm going to talk to you about a particular situation and show you a little video of a uh, of, a, of a, a mentor i have a ton of admiration for who who did put the pro into project or we'll say pro into project and talk with a british accent um don't start it yet i need to preface it I'm just crossing my fingers. It works, Kathy. Oh, there's that. Oh, good point. We'll, we'll leave that to... If it doesn't, you'll have to tell them. <laughs> okay, I will. It this morning. Anyway, this is, this is a little clip, just a short little clip from a, a mentor named Heather Furman. She's in North Carolina, and she has an extensive background in scouting. Uh, she's fun. She's uh, challenging. She brings out the best in people. I mean, she's just very a very admirable mentor and she's teaching you know in this video it's it's part of her sort of freedom uh class and at the end of the semester she has this big huge simulation called the x games and the kids are you know just like looking forward to it all semester and they have to earn their ammunition so they 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 uh, come each week and they do a shootout and in the shootout is where they where they get the money, you know, the, the sort of freedom bucks to buy their, um, to buy their ammunition at the end of the semester. And oh, by the way, the, the team that they're on the North or the South, um, that their money is, is used to, to buy it, you know, it's pooled. So they're learning a little interdependence there. Right. Um, and encouraging each other to, to do these things. So a, a student might be, might be, uh, able to shoot a certain number of times based on what they did. Did they bring a paper? 
you know, did they finish reading the book? And she has, you know, these lists of things that the kids know that these are, these are opportunities that give me a shootout. So this girl is, is using a little, uh, rubber band gun and I just don't want you to miss the the look on her face before she shoots she turns around and looks at the camera you don't really need to listen to the sound um it's more just the look on her face as she shoots that blackboard I don't know if you don't hit anything else I'll give it to you but if you do we won't because I didn't see it very well 500 yeah so so she just turns around and gets this like like a little smirk on her face like and uh and then she shoots the board and you know gets 100 points for hitting you know this square and 500 points for hitting that one and you know, and is helping out her team. Anyway, so this is an example of something we could never have trained this mentor in because we wouldn't have been clever enough to think of it. <laughs> so when you go to training, yes, absorb everything. You're, you know, every trainer has different different sets of skills that they bring to your your training, and and we're all trying to give you great ideas. Um, but the uh, the, the value here of, of, uh, of bringing with you to your classroom, your genius cannot be overstated. If you're a musician, bring music. If you're an artist, bring your art. It doesn't matter that it's not in the project, you know? <clears throat> Feel free to, to make it even better based on, on your particular set of skills and, and really your, your whole life experience. Because you have something to, to bring that, you know, that nobody else could. There's a reason why you're a mentor in the classroom. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. I just so agree with that. Okay. We talked a lot about some of the youth scholar projects. We do want to talk about the adult scholar projects. Uh, the first one is library community series. Uh, one of it's not shown up here, but the library community series has a gathering project so that if you are gathering your community, um, it has an, a, an apprentice scholar level project in it, the five pillar tutorial. Anyway, library community series is amazing and it helps you. Uh, one of my favorite parts about it is the assessment that it has to help you assess your entire community. Um, from the little children all the way up to the grandparents, the, the ones, the families that are, part, are members, it helps you assess and figure out their needs. And um, there's many skills that you gain by taking library community series. And we've talked about the library community school builder. And this is for, for those who need to build a Commonwealth school um, with the educational philosophy of leadership education, any of the existing Commonwealth schools um, in their training, they are welcome to add this training to whatever training they're already receiving. Um, it's a beautiful resource. It's, it's very helpful. It teaches you, it's based on teaching you a principle and then you learn how to take it through the statesmanship matrix and um, decide the form. That, that you're going to use. And uh, I already read to you what, what Olivia Vota said about this. Okay, the Family Foundation Scholar Project. I'm, I'm, I have to tell you that I think certain things had to be in place before we could build the Family Foundation Scholar Project. I think the technology that we have right now had to be in place. I think that we had to learn um, the best of every project. <laughs> before we could build the Family Foundation um, Scholar Project. And uh, we also needed to learn um, and read Ramo's book because of some of the lessons that we teach in here, specifically from him, like Kathy mentioned, Gates and Gateland. And I, I don't think we're actually teaching that principle during this um, portion of the seminar, but the Family Foundation Scholar Project has 40, it has, it's two parts. It's basically um, for the moms and dads class in your school, and it introduces 
48 different leadership education principles, and it is geared toward training the parent mentor. It, the purpose is to strengthen the homeschool and the family and to strengthen the relationships um, of, the, of the members of the family and to uh, basically teach mentoring and principles. So the genius, the design genius behind this project is I already mentioned this, that you have the in-class part, and then you also get a weekly lesson in your inbox that's about a 20-minute experience. And um, last night, I took my Commonwealth mom and dads through through one of the lessons that they're going to experience in class and one of the lessons that they get through the email when they um, get mentored by us at Lemmy. And it, it was fascinating. It was awesome. So this is this scholar project. Now, some people, you might know people who would benefit from um, the email portion. That's called the Family Foundation Membership, where you get those lessons every week. You might know someone who, who isn't part of your Commonwealth school, and they're not taking um, the Family Foundation Scholar Project but their family could really, really benefit from learning these principles, which strengthens their family. And they can just buy a membership without having to take the scholar project, but it is meant to be um, the two parts. All right, let's get this one going, right? Kathy, did you want to say anything before we start this one? Well, I just wanted to say that, that um, you know, maybe it would be good if they had the option to, to start right away because it is a cycle if you, you know, start in, in, June, you can end in June. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's great to start in fall because that's where we start with vision and we, you know, firmly believe that vision is, is, uh, is, is central, but nevertheless, it's something that you could start anytime. Yep. That's true. Okay. We're going to show this little video. <laughs> so this is a video about a, about a, uh, a artificial intelligence and it's, uh, it's something that you can think about in terms of, of learning and mentoring and your life. Okay, do you see it, Kathy? Yeah. Okay. When you uh, when you watch that and you see the many um, I don't know iterations of failure, right? You you can you can really apply that to mentoring because if if artificial intelligence can learn from failure, um, certainly we can. And am I creating an environment where failure can happen without you know being embarrassed or humiliated or ashamed? You know, there's there's none of that with this. Um, and then after you know our little conversation about 
about Ramo and um, the networks and all the different influences that are influencing our students. If, if in this day and age, we can have a computer that teaches itself how to walk, even though it's never seen walking, <coughs> how, um, how is that gonna change the, the face of the, of the future that makes the old models and quite honestly, the old fears and insecurities about education um, obsolete, right? We have to be raising individuals who can think, who recognize freedom, who abhor bondage. You know, we have to be, we have to be preparing them for the unpreparable uh, to be able to see that, that uh, you know, our, our unique gifts to the world have got to be better than what can be created by a computer. I mean, there are so many, so many lessons. Every time I watch this, and I've watched it many times, um, I think of new things, you know? I mean, it's like it's little tiny mini classic in my life. I love the arm that's like shaking as he runs. And I think to myself, that looks ridiculous. You know, how in the world does that computer think that that is gonna make him go any faster? Like, why can't he figure out that if he was in opposite synchronization with his <laughs> legs, that he'd be more, you know, more successful? But then you see him do those jumps sideways and you're like, OK, there's there's something to this. And maybe he's just given a victory, you know, a victory arm up in the air. So learning to see things in new ways, learning to apply our, our principles in new ways. So we would like to to thank you so much for joining us and hope that your experience and your training is absolutely transformational. I can't tell you how many mentors have told me that that their their time at training, you know, really literally changed their lives. And they come back and they do another one, and they're exposed to the to the different genius of a of a new trainer and the different you know power behind a project. You know, you heard Angel talking about her class. I want to be in her class, don't you? I mean, would you like to be one of her Georgia students? <laughs> you know, who knows what kind she's, of miracle she's training Georgics this year in Salt Lake. Like yeah, I just said I wanted to be like in her actual class, that too, but yeah, that I'd, too. I'd be in her training also. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope that this presentation uh, has helped to expand your understanding of leadership education and specifically given you some mentoring tools that you can bring to, to your project, you know, as you put the pro into project and I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share that because we are can you know we are affected by who and what we're connected to that we are changed by those connections that I can I know I speak for for Tiffany and and the whole Lemmy team as I as I say that we're grateful for the opportunity that we've had to to connect with you today and look forward to many many connections in the future. It would help us a great deal if you uh, increased our connection by liking our page. We have a Lemmy page on Facebook and we also have the Lemmy Mentors Association. We need you to join that. That's where you can ask questions of your peers and also the trainers. We respond quite often and, um, and interact with other people who are doing hard things in their lives and sharing their successes and, and their failures. So, you know, if you join that, Lemmy Mentor Association is the name of the group. That's a group. And then we have the Lemmy Mentor page. That's where we share um, additional content. We're constantly making content. And, um, and you know, obviously we have your email address, but having, a, having you access us through social media would be great. We have, uh, you can follow us on, on Instagram and, and Twitter and Pinterest as well to increase our connection and our ability to to impact, um, impact your life and for you to impact us and make us a better company. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to, to present with Tiffany today. I hope you can feel her, her love for you and, and her vision for this company. I, I, uh, I can't tell you how it's changed my life um, in so many ways and in such fabulous, fabulous ways how it's impacted my own family. I'm grateful for that, and I'm and I'm grateful for the opportunity that I've had to share with you today. Kathy, thank you. I'm I appreciate um, 
the many, many, many times that I've learned from you and being able to teach with you today and the uh, dedication that you have as a mentor to your students. Um, I'm not sure if you can still hear me. I think you can. <laughs> Someone yeah. asked uh, what our websites are, our two websites are lemmymentortraining.com and librarycommunities.com. The Family Foundation membership is at librarycommunities.com. And so is the builder, the library community school builders at librarycommunities.com also. That's right. In fact, uh, we we hope that that this fall we will be able to get on monthly with um, the leaders of the all of the Commonwealths and library communities each month for about 30 minutes in a Zoom room um, where I'll come on, we'll connect with each other, we'll talk about our communities, um, associate together, and um, I'll use my spiritualized to see what your needs are. Sometimes I might highlight something from the builder um, and try to meet your needs as best as I can. And, and my team, we, we have a lot of experience building communities. Uh, all of us, all of us have built them wherever we've moved. <laughs> and um, so, so please watch for that. Please, if you're interested in being part of that, because you think one day you might build a school or be on a board, um, email us so we can put you on the list if, if you're interested in, in being part of that uh, monthly um, Zoom uh, leadership training. So, and, and it might be useful to just tell you that there's two main email addresses that you need to know. One is for our secretary and event coordinator, and hers is registerlemmy at gmail.com. And then the other is Rick, the master of all, and uh, his is officelemmy at gmail.com. You can also reach out to me personally. I'm unleashing your voice at gmail.com. Yeah. And, and that leadership training is, uh, is, it, there's no fee for that, so don't let that um, stop you. This is this is literally to help help us connect, and it's a community um, where where we can all get better at what we're doing. So let us know if you're interested in that. And meanwhile, thank you. Send us your questions, and we we look forward to seeing you in in our trainings this summer. Okay, awesome. So thanks for coming. All right. We'll see everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>